Welcome everyone to the Wizard of Radical Self-Respect. As you can see, I have a guest here today who I look very much forward to speaking with because I think he's going to have a unique perspective that it is not often heard. And today's guest, as you can see, is Dr. Mark Eatonson. He specializes in the treatment of pathological narcissism. And I think it's going to be very interesting hearing what he has to say about this topic. So with that, how are you today, Dr. Eatonson? I'm well, thanks. You can call me Mark. Uh, Hi. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on, Mark. I appreciate it. And so does the rest of the audience here. So perhaps you can get into how you started what you're doing here. And for those who don't know, he also wrote Unmasking Narcissism, the book, which I would recommend as well. Yeah. And I also have a, a YouTube channel called Heal NPD uh, that where I make uh, videos uh, about the topic of pathological narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder and uh, from a from a psychological perspective. So really kind of taking a look at uh, the mental illness uh, involved in uh, in pathological narcissism. Um, but how I got here? Um, so, you know, um, the very first patient I ever treated uh, in when I was in grad school and I was, you know, doing my my practicum training um, was uh, was just I it was the, the therapy was so difficult and I just I had no idea what was going on. And I would talk to my supervisor and my supervisor would kind of be like, oh, I don't know, you know, he's it's a tough patient. Right. <laughs> uh, so um, but the, the thing was, is uh, I, I had to use that patient uh, for my master's qualifying uh, exam. And that was like a big uh, paper that I had to write about a, uh, a therapy that I was conducting. And I had to do an oral defense of that treatment uh, in front of a panel of professors. Right. And so I, I really felt that I needed to understand, you know, the dynamics that were occurring in the therapy room and why this was such a, treat a difficult treatment and, and such a provocative one in terms of what it was stirring up inside of me as well. Um, and so I, I hit the library, you know, I, I hit the books and uh, I, I had the good fortune of, I think, just accidentally stumbling across a couple of very solid um, books uh, about narcissistic personality disorder um, that, you know, were talking about it from a psychoanalytic perspective. Uh, which is has it's not so much in vogue these days, but uh, you know I, I was I was kind of pulling books off the shelf, you know that that dated back to the 1960s even, you know just trying to get a sense of like once I understood oh this seems to be NPD, then I wanted to understand what was actually going on in the room, you know not just a, a list of of check boxes right, I wanted to understand how to work with this person, how to help this person, how to understand. The pushes and pulls that were happening in the therapy outside of just you know well it's an he's arrogant you know that doesn't actually tell you anything about right. the person's psychology right why is he arrogant why is he so defensive why it you know why is he asking me to see my treatment notes <laughs> right you know what's that about um and so um i ended up doing a lot of reading i wrote that case conceptualization i defended it in front of the panel of you know the panel of professors, right? Um, and uh, and that was the end of it, really, until I had to write a dissertation to get my doctoral degree. And um, I remember going into the library again and just kind of being like, I don't know what I'm going to write about, you know? And so I just started like looking up terms, like in EBSCOhost, which is like the, <laughs> I remember. You know, like the, yeah, like the research paper archive, you know? And, um, and I decided to just follow my interests. And uh, it took me to like two topics came up again and again and again. And that was narcissism and attachment. And so I decided to put those two together uh, for my dissertation and to look at pathological well, narcissistic personality disorder through the lens of attachment theory. Um, and um, because attachment theory is this really robust body of research that looks at, you know, from, from infancy through the lifespan, right? In other words, what kinds of attachment relationships, you know, how often you're held, how your parents interact with you and those kinds of things, how does that impact adult relationships and adult psychology, right? So that research exists in the attachment field, not so much when looking at narcissism, right. but it so happens that there are two types of adult attachment 
that correspond almost perfectly with um, the, the kind of two presentations of pathological narcissism, which, which is grandiose and vulnerable. And the corresponding attachment styles would be dismissing um, avoidant attachment and fearful avoidant attachment. And so I kind of superimposed the attachment model onto uh, the, the, the you know, theories about narcissism and, and so looked at the developmental origins of narcissism. And, um, and that was really eye-opening for me. And it led to me writing the book that I wrote and ultimately just specializing in this area of practice because I feel like I really under, I was able to really understand the, the humanity uh, involved in how narcissistic pathology is developed. Um, that is very interesting. I know attachment theory is a very interesting concept, and I think it that is the base. That is the baseline that starts a lot of the adaptations that we have in our adult lives. And yeah. I know you've mentioned before a good representation of a grandiose narcissist versus a vulnerable narcissist is in Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Gaston would be the grandiose narcissist, and the Beast would be more of the vulnerable narcissist. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I, I want to just underscore that, you know, when we're talking about like grandiose narcissists versus vulnerable narcissists, it's not like really there, are, there's not like two types necessarily. There's, there's pathological narcissism, and then there are different expressions of that pathology, right? And so one of them is to be, to try to compensate, but let me put it like this, the heart in my perspective uh, of pathological narcissism is um, unstable, unrealistic um, self-image, okay? So that can go either way, right? It can be unrealistic in a positive direction where the person is grandiose, like Gaston, you know, like, you know, every last inch of me is covered with hair, you know, I mean, like this sort of like, just like, yeah. you know, this really arrogant, like egotistical guy, right? Um, but it can also go in the other direction, right? It can be negatively uh, unrealistic. It can be unrealistic in the negative direction, where the person feels like they're worthless and like they're, you know, they're filled with feelings of shame and self contempt. Um, and so, the same person can and often does, you know, kind of bounce between those different self images. Um, so. Um, yeah, but if we're if we're talking, one way of kind of like helping us to understand those differences in presentation is to use like a proto like a prototype grandiose presentation right. and a prototype vulnerable presentation, and so that would be like yeah, Gaston would be the grandiose one, right? Uh, and and the prototype vulnerable presentation would be the Beast from from that story, right? You know, he's he's. Um, there is a grandiose self-conception inside of the beast, right? Where he's like, he's got the picture of himself as this, you know, regal prince, this beautiful person on the wall that he used to be, right? But it's in tatters, right? Uh, and and um, and and he feels that he's lost uh, his connection to that grandiose self-image. Right. right. And so he's in despair because of it. And he's angry and he's, he's left with just his own um, f feelings of inadequacy. And, and everything in him wants to get back to that grandiose right. self-image. Right. Whereas Gaston is terrified of the beast. He's terrified of losing his grandiose self-image. Right. So. And Gaston, he would be exactly like the beast if the spell was put on him. If That's the right. spell was put on Gaston, he would be the beast in all of the same kinds of ways. He'd be very interesting in that regard. And something else you made me think of there when you were speaking. I was watching an Alex Hermosi video the other day, and he said the three tools of the most successful people, and you'll probably get a kick out of this. He said, one is a superior attitude, two, an extreme fear or insecurity that they will not succeed hmm. or not meet their potential. And then three, impulse control. And I thought to myself, that sounds a lot like a narcissistic person with impulse control. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Like there's, and, and, you know, it's interesting, actually. There is a, um, so the main uh, 
assessment instrument used to research narcissism is the uh, NPI, the Narcissistic Personality Inventory. There's lots of problems with the NPI. Uh, and one of them is that uh, there's, there's a lot of research that suggests that it doesn't actually uh, measure mental illness, that it actually measures a, a high functioning version of narcissism where there is a grandiose self-concept, uh, there is a, a, a fear of failure uh, and, and, it, and a high level of like social and professional effectiveness. You know, so uh, like the corporate leaders of the world would score highly on the NPI, you know, right. for instance. We, we, and, the, and I actually made a video uh, about how, you know, the NPI being the main instrument that we use to investigate narcissism is really problematic because it doesn't measure mental illness. It measures this other version of narcissism that's sort of not pathological right? Uh, in, in, in a way. It, they're just kind of it's it, they're difficult to get along with, but not it's not really mental illness, you know, um, and so it skews the research and thereby, you know, the diagno the diagnostic picture of what NPD is uh, in that direction, and that's why I think a lot of people don't consider NPD to be mental illness. I think they consider it to be something else. The I asshole understand. disorder. Ah, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, this might surprise people, this question I'm about to ask you, but do you see a lot of narcissistic people that come to you that admit they have an issue? Or what are the kinds of people that come to you yeah. for help? Well, so it used to be not so much the case. Um, it used to be that I would get referrals from colleagues who knew that I kind of had this area of specialty. And, uh, and so those those folks would, would not be kind of self-identifying as having issues with narcissism. Um, but, you know, they would typically be um, somebody who, who's maybe in a more, like, maybe more along the lines of that kind of vulnerable narcissistic presentation. Right. Right. Because it, it, when somebody's in a grandiose or a, com a uh, compensate, like a compensated state, you know, a defended state, they don't seek therapy. Right. Everything's fine. Thank you very much. You know, it's, right. I'm fine. I'm just fine over here. Right. Um, it's, it's when those defenses collapse. Uh, that they then seek therapy. And so that that would be the kind of referral I would tend to I get. I see, yeah. Um, now, since I've written the book and I've got the YouTube channel and other stuff about me is out there, um, I get a lot of people who are self-identifying as struggling with these issues, um, seeking me out. So I, I get mm. emails on a so regular So that part basis. would surprise a lot of people because... And I know I see people say this and they'll say, well, if someone thinks they're the narcissist, that means they're not the narcissist. And I say, I don't know about that one, Jack, because yeah. there's a lot of people out there that can admit they have an issue. And it might be that they have narcissistic adaptations. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, they're, they're not. It's it's not. Um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, um, mutually exclusive. Right. Y you can you can have insight and still struggle with the issues. You know, Freud is famous for, for saying insight alone is not curative. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's, it's it, just having the, the cognitive insight doesn't mean that you have insight into what's actually happening on the inside or that you can access the feelings that you're defended against, or that you can change the patterns of behavior in your life that are problematic. Right. I mean, I think the insight, is a very important first step having the self-awareness oh okay yeah. let me take a look at my side of the street here to see what i can be doing better but the self-awareness alone like you said that's not it's not going to be the end all be all you got to make take actions from there right it's like it's like necessary but it's not sufficient you know yes exactly yeah. so what does the treatment of pathological narcissism look like well, it's, it's, you, you, you proceed very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, you know, um, BPD, NPD, you know, these are, these are sort of famously difficult disorders to treat. And in part, because there's a lot of interpersonal antagonism and provocation that happens. Um, the person tends to be very reactive sure. to information about themselves. Um, and, uh, and they tend to externalize. Right. So it's not my fault. It's your fault. Right. Right. Um, so so that's that's the kind of high bar. That's like the high hurdle uh, when it comes to treatment. 
you know, so it, so it's a it's a it's a delicate dance, trying to hold the person's insecurities, validate them for what they are, without gratifying the pathology or the mm. pathological behavior, right? Um, and very gently over time, building up enough of a foundation of trust in that relationship that you can begin to poke holes in that armor, especially for, for NPD, that, that armor, that grandiose false self armor. Um, the, the person is, there's no way that they're going to step outside of that willingly without an awful lot of trust having been developed and without having sort of developed uh, the, like the capacity to regard themselves in non-polarized ways. Right. Right. So, not, you know, to regard themselves in ways that are more gray and less black and white, you know, I'm the best, I'm the worst, but to find that gray area in the middle where it's like, no, you're, you're a person, you know, and right. everybody has good and bad qualities. Everybody has strengths and weaknesses. We're all a soupy mess of, you know, thoughts and feelings and, and attributes, right? So to get to that point, um, the, the first year, sometimes more of the treatment is really about holding and validating without gratifying. And that's, that's the delicate piece. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And I think, like you said, narcissistic people are very sensitive to any kind of criticism or perceived criticism. And when they hear some feedback that kind of triggers a narcissistic injury, for lack of a better word, they'll then try to attack the source of that injury. And yes. then they, they think it's you. And I've heard things like the grandiose, the omnipotent grandiose defense, where they'll put someone else down that they have perceived as insulting them yeah. or criticizing them in a way that simultaneously lifts themselves up. And you see that in action a lot with, with the grandiose variety. And I think also, this is another theory of mine. So mm -hmm. people who go to AA or NA, for example, I think there's some very therapeutic things in the step working guides of those programs and then how they work with sponsors. Mm -hmm. And it is a spiritual program that it does help, I think, people that have narcissistic adaptations too. But what do you think about that? I mean, I think it's a it's a decent model. Um, in particular, the first step, which is realizing or admitting to oneself that that they've lost control over their life, which I think is designed and effective at just undercutting ego right out of the gate, right? Um, and I think that's that is an important aspect in in um, for a lot of people, maybe not everybody, but for a lot of people in the treatment of substance abuse disorders and substance abuse issues, right? Um, realizing that I can't manage this problem, right? Right, And admitting that to myself and admitting it to a group of people who will hold me accountable to that reality, right? Um, it means that I can't just go off and try to treat this by myself because I'll fail, right? right. I need, I need re recognizing and admitting that I need this treatment um, and this support is a big piece of undercutting the the, the, the kind of um, dysfunctional cycles involved in addiction. In addiction, right? Um, and and um, you know, I would be interested to see research if there is any out there about kind of a twelve-step model applied to something like NPD. I think that would be a very interesting um, study to read. I think. Like, for example, I've been through a step working guide before for several different reasons. And yeah. if, say, they replace, like a narcissistic person, they replace the word addiction with supply or mm -hmm. whatever their quote-unquote self-esteem juice or fuel would be. Uh -huh. And they just fill in the blank with that. And I think that would be a pretty effective way to try to get to the same result. Now, Go ahead. The, what I was going to say was, are there indicators that you would say are like, okay, this is a way you might be able to tell that a narcissistic person has changed or has, or at the very least improved. Do you have any indicators or are you 
are you hesitant to give any kind of guidelines in that way? Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> a big one for me, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, let me, I just need to think for just a second to make sure that I put this the way that I want to put yeah. it. Um, That's a, I understand. Yeah. Um, so the ability to grieve is like to really grieve, I think is a, is a significant indicator to me that someone has developed and progressed beyond the sort of um, developmental fixations that cause a lot of the pathology in personality disorders. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm just trying to think of how to put that, like, whether it's whether I can explain that in a way that doesn't go too far afield into like the tech technical stuff. Well, maybe like connected with their emotions more or connected with their authentic selves without it being an adaptation of some like defense. Yeah. Yes. So when we grieve, right, it's because something like it's it's an it's a profound acknowledgement of a loss, right? And a loss over which we have no control. Right. Something was taken from me. I lost someone I love. Um, grieving for one's own lost childhood or the 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 ways, you know, the, the ways sure. that the, the person suffered when they were young, right? To to grieve is to really let it be true that harm was done, that 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 there's a hurt, that there's a loss without that like you're saying that kind of defensive adaptation of ego coming in and saying nope i got this right <laughs> i can be self-sufficient without this i'm i'm impervious to this pain i'll just go out and be impressive or be shiny or be beautiful or i'll go have sex with a lot of people or i'll go do some drugs or i'll whatever it might be to try to fill that 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 hole and 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 maintain a denial that it that it's real mm. I feel like to be able to really take a look at loss and to really feel it is is a sign that a person is um, to, to use analytic terminology in in the neurotic range of functioning um, where there's object constancy mm. where you can't just magically rewrite history or rewrite your personal relationships or rewire somehow your your um, sense of self to get rid of to eject pain to get rid of it that that's that's more the borderline range of functioning to okay ejecting pain, unwanted pain getting rid of unwanted self images projecting right um externalizing um using other things like splitting that distort or warp uh reality right when you're in the sort of this this more neurotic range this more kind of developmentally mature range of functioning you're able to tolerate the fact that you're you know not not perfect right and not being perfect doesn't mean that you're worthless right there's you've made space inside for the the gray areas of nuance yeah nuance yeah and i think just even being able to honestly talk about the issues and to, and to circle back to an AA NA thing, mm -hmm. like honesty is very important there. Like getting people to be in touch with honestly what they're thinking and feeling. And they'll have sponsorship where you know, the sponsorship will pretty much give them some unconditional acceptance. But then they'll also kind of kick them in the butt sometimes if they think that yeah. they're, they're getting off the rails a little bit. But I think the dynamics of that kind of relationship is absolutely what someone with a narcissistic adaptation would need where right? they can be honest, they can open up without the fear of like being judged or condemned mm -hmm. too badly, but they're not going to let them just be ultimate only validation because I do think that has its limits. Yeah. You know, I think, I think there's some, some promising ideas there. Um, I, I have had patients who have also been in AA or, or um, uh, not NA, but um, SLA. Uh, sex and love oh, addicts, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and have had uh, there's been mixed mixed results there. So sure. sometimes 
it's who do these people think they are, you know, telling me how I'm supposed to be wanting me to, you know, admit these, these things, you know, sure. and, and sometimes they've found it really helpful. I got you. Yeah. So I know for just anyone in general, like say someone's in a relationship with a narcissistic person right now and they're listening to it, or maybe they're the narcissistic person themselves. I always say to people, if someone doesn't admit they have a problem and then try to do something about it, there is no use hoping or expecting they will change. Like that's number one. And that usually cuts out most of the people. But let's say, for example, someone does admit they have an issue. They do admit they have an issue. They can admit it. They have the humility and the honesty to accept that. And they're trying to move forward. What is your suggestions to people in that kind of situation? And I know it's going to depend on the situation, but is there guidelines for that? So you would mean like somebody who maybe is beginning to self-identify as, as like having NPD or pathological? On both sides of it. On both sides. Oh, okay. So someone's in a relationship with one kind of that's like a self-identified yeah. narcissist and like, okay, this guy's admitting he has an issue here. He's got that kind of the acceptance down. What do you say? Because that's a, that's a hard spot to be in. I wouldn't even know what I would say to well, that the person. Part of the difficulty, you know, is that it's really hard to find – you know, non-stigmatizing information about this disorder online. It's just, right. it's almost impossible. And I think collectively there's been this sort of shoulder shrugging and sort of like, well, these people can't fix these people, you know, right. All we can do is talk about like how to avoid them, you right. know? And, and so when somebody like actually begins to understand that, oh my gosh, like I've got an issue here. Um, they, the first thing that they do is they go online and they, they find all of these videos and all of these articles that are just that, you know, calling them the, the monsters. Right. Um, and, uh, and so, and that's, that's problematic for a lot of reasons. Um, one, not the least of which being that, you know, uh, NPD is correlated with suicide, right? I mean, these right. are, this is an at risk population for self-harm and suicide, um, and, and people don't realize that because they've got this skewed idea of what NPD is. All they see is Gaston, right? right. Gaston's not at risk for suicide, right? I mean, he, he right? He doesn't need anything. Right. You know, he's just an asshole. Uh, and, and, and what's left out is the other side of the equation. All of the pain and chaos that's inside of that person that necessitates this grandiose false self-presentation. And, and, and as soon as enough emotional stress happens, that grandiose self, those adaptations you're talking about, they crumble and the person is exposed to the pain and the trauma and the chaos inside. And, and, and it, it can be a very dangerous situation for the person and, and sometimes for other people as well. Right. Um, because they're in crisis. And people um, have a hard time with any kind of empathy towards that situation, especially yeah. like in the beginning, if they've been on the receiving end of some of their poor treatment, they just can't even hear any of that no. without getting yeah. triggered and upset. And yeah. to a point, I understand it, but there's a point eventually, and we talked about this before we went live, where I have the three phases of healing, where at first you might get obsessed with watching videos about narcissism, et cetera. You watch all of the creators. Then you begin to take a look at your own side of the street to see what you could have done better. You know that you weren't perfect in the relationship either. And then you get to the letting go of resentment part mm. in the third phase. And I do think that's an essential phase because it does help people get better themselves yeah. when they stop looking at the other person as just the evil narcissistic person. And I think what you just said could help people get to that point. That's that's really one of the main goals of my work uh, outside of, you know, like doing psychotherapy with patients. You know, the reason I started my YouTube channel and wrote, wrote the book and all this other stuff is, is because um, I just recognize that there's a lot of misinformation uh, out there about about this issue. And, and the vast majority of resources that are available for people address that first stage that you're, that you've identified, right? But 
when you start trying to get to like the second or the third stage, you know, it's, it gets, it's like a wasteland. There's like, right. there's no, there's no, you know, no water in sight, you know, like there's no resources really. I mean, very few and far between right. that will actually help people to, to, to grieve. Right. And to come to a more uh, holistic understanding of, of themselves, of the person who, who hurt them, uh, of, of the dynamics that were involved there. And, and I think ultimately um, to forgive. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean to forget, you know, but, but to, I, I think a crucial step in healing is forgiveness. Forgiving yourself for being a victim or for not having seen the signs or for whatever happened and also forgiving the other person too, uh, which is, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna be pissed off that I say that, but um, again, to forgive somebody doesn't mean that, you know, you, you're, you're not, you know, that, that you somehow um, erase the pain or the, or the injury or the wrong that was done. That's not right. forgiveness. Forgiveness is holding the wrong that was done and the pain that it caused and a complete understanding of that with a complete understanding that the person is is a human being and maybe they were mentally ill or maybe they were on substances or maybe they had wrong ideas about the world or maybe they you know whatever the case may be right but just trying to create a whole picture that doesn't leave any of the parts out right I think what people get caught up on with forgiveness is they think it means, oh, I have to let them back into my life. No, I have yeah. to be in a relationship with them. And I say, no, that's not what forgiveness should mean. Yeah. And it's part of the reason why I like to say letting go of resentment, because okay. yeah. ultimately it's, I want people to be the happiest and healthiest version of themselves today. Mm -hmm. And what is the thinking? What is the thought process that will help someone do that? And I think when someone has let go of resentment, that's a good way to help you become the happiest and healthiest version of yourself today, yeah. because you're not all caught up and angry at the past harms that you've experienced. I like that. I think, yeah, letting go of resentment is, is a key facet. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the term forgiveness is so, I, it's also so heavily, you know, um, burdened by you know people like spirituality and sure. you know it, it, like religious stuff like it, it, you know depending on what religious tradition a person might come from forgiveness means different things so maybe letting go of resentments is a better right. a better phrase yeah because i know there's like religious narcissists or spiritual narcissistic types they'll try to twist and manipulate that forgiveness angle and mm -hmm. they'll do it like in the process in the yeah. midst of it they'll say you to be a good Christian, you need to forgive me. Right. And it, it kind of gives people a bad taste in their mouth, I think. Yes. Yeah. For, no, forgiveness, I think, is always an organic process that you come yeah. to honestly after you've gone through all the pain and after you've experienced all the anger and after, you know, like, like after the fire has raged through the forest, right? And then that new like right. growth, like that little sprig like pops up, right? And you're like, ah. Here it is. Like now we're yeah. organic. I think that's a great way to put yeah. it. So it's yeah. something that's come from with you, not something that's been prompted by them or mm -hmm. prompted by something else. It's something yeah. that you're coming to on your own. I think that's yeah. a good distinction. Now you mentioned there's a lot of misinformation about narcissism right now. Yeah. I would like to hear what you believe is the misinformation. Yeah. So I just, you know, I just made a video last week uh, on my channel that was, it's, titled is NPD really a mental illness? Because um, <clears throat> I, you know, I get these comments that are like, you know, NPD is a personality disorder, not a mental illness, you know, uh, or NPD is a choice, not a mental illness. And, and um, NPD is evil, mm. not a mental illness. NPD is uh, the result of demonic possession, not a mental illness. And uh, all of these ideas are out there and they're, they're you know, uh, proliferated you know, on, on different, you know, by different experts, right? You know, some few of whom have actual training in mental health, right? <laughs> but, but still, you know, are still calling themselves an expert on narcissistic abuse or narcissistic abuse recovery or whatever it might be. Sure. And, 
Um, <clears throat> so I, I just, I feel like there's a lot of, yeah, misinformation that people kind of steep themselves in, you know, uh, how to recognize these five signs to recognize a narcissist or whatever it might be. And what they, what they kind of, what they aren't hearing is that, you know, narcissistic personality disorder is very much a mental illness. It is not a matter of choice. Some of the things that a person does when they have NPD are a matter of choice. But the distortions in perception and self-perception and the perception of other people, the issues with Im impulse control, right? The tendency to externalize or to split or to project or to engage in other really maladaptive psychological defenses that occur at the pre-conscious level, right? They're, these are not studied choices that the person is making. You know, that's why it's a mental illness. Right. right. <clears throat> people have a hard time kind of parsing out like, okay, if the person's mentally ill, does that mean they're still responsible? You know, if the person's mentally ill, does that mean that they have no choice in their behavior, right? And that's not true, right? People who are with mental illness aren't like automatons. They're not like robots just acting up programming, right? Mental illness is, is more nuanced and complicated than that. Sometimes it's hard to see. Sometimes it doesn't look the way that we expect, right? Um, most narcissists are pretty high functioning in the world. They're not, you know, sort of bouncing off the walls, right? They're not, they're, they're not ranting on street corners. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not psychosis most of the time, right? It's, which is, you know, psychosis, by the way, just in case anybody doesn't know is, um, it, a failure of reality testing, right? The, the inability to sort of deal with or cope with reality. And so, so the person is hallucinating or, or having delusions instead, right? Um, most of the time, NPD is not that. Most of the time, it's a pattern of thinking and behaving that's really problematic interpersonally and that uh, involves incredibly fragile self-esteem and extreme reactivity to feelings of, of threat to, to their self-image. Um, so what, what was the question? <laughs> I feel like I talked about, myself about, off, about off misinformation the about the misinformation. Oh, misinformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, so, um, and even if a person doesn't have NPD, right. Even if they don't qualify for like the, the, or, or the, the narcissistic issues aren't pervasive enough or disruptive enough in their life that you would say, yes, this is a personality disorder. They can still struggle with pathological narcissism, which is a, a broader category of mental illness. But, you know, pathological narcissism shows up in all kinds of disorders, shows up in major depressive disorder, for instance, where a person's self-image is really negatively skewed, right? They feel worthless. They feel like a, an abject failure in their life. They feel like nobody really loves them or could ever love them, right? That That is a form of pathological narcissism. Um, it's not to say that people with depression are narcissists. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there are, there is a broad category of mental illness that has to do with a person's self image and whether or not that self image is stable, positive, and realistic. And when it's not one of those three things, then we would say that's pathological narcissism. Mm -hmm. It can be transient. It can just show up in the form of, you know, a, a, a depressive disorder. And then when the person recovers from that, they're, they're back in that kind of healthy narcissism range where they have a stable, positive and realistic self-image, or it can be more pervasive and lifelong. And right. then we would say, well, this is more of a narcissistic personality disorder. I got you. And yeah. I know they do say that narcissism can be misdiagnosed as bipolar yeah. up to 50% of the time. I've also been hearing more and more about the ADHD and narcissism overlap as well, where they can be comorbid. And of course, there's people who have ADHD that are not narcissistic, but yeah. they can also be, there can be a combination of both. It's hard sometimes to tell the difference between a bipolar process and a narcissistic one. And that's because uh, when somebody has significant pathological narcissism, uh, th there's a tendency to vacillate, to flip-flop between a grandiose self-image and a depleted, vulnerable one. 
And so the, the grandiosity can look like mania or hypomania right. Right. and the depleted self image can lead to depressive episodes. Uh, and so it, it, it really can look like bipolar disorder and bipolar disorder can, if you know enough about NPD, look like NPD sometimes. Sure. And, and I and, always think about Kanye, how Kanye was diagnosed with bipolar. I'm like, well, mm. I'm no doctor, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was one of those 50 percent. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I don't I, I don't know enough about Kanye, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I just I know what I what I saw at like the Grammys, I think, when he like, took the trophy <laughs> away from Taylor Swift. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and the world. Classic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> classic. So I think all of what we talked about, too, people get caught up on this thing, too, where trauma can be an explanation for bad behavior, but it's not an excuse That's for right. bad behavior. And I think knowing that part of it, I think it's very helpful because if you do think there's a choice in there somewhere, that's it's good and bad. Like the good part of it is if there's any kind of choice, there can be a choice to do better too. Mm -hmm. So that kind of agency, I think ultimately can be helpful if you want positive solutions. Yeah. You know, I think of um, <clears throat> the, the issue of choice and free will. I mean, this is, that's a, that is really tricky philosophical awesome. territory. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, and, and, and it's by no means like a settled issue. Like, no, are, like no. top, you know, top philosophers are like, are grappling with this issue as we speak. Right. I'm going to try um, to get Sam Harris to talk about that with me. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He, <laughs> he that's one of his favorite topics. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and others too. Right. Um, but I guess I think about choice as kind of a fuzzy process, you know? Um, so if I choose to take a drink of my coffee right now, right? Did, where did that impulse come from? Can I really say that I like conjured out of thin air, right? The idea that I was going to take a drink of coffee just then, right. or is it based it, or, or, mm -hmm. Am I kind of riding on the tip of this massive, you know, uh, iceberg, right, of, of my neurology and somewhere inside my brain, unconsciously, the idea of taking a drink of coffee occurred and then it rose up to consciousness. And I said, oh, I think I'll have some coffee. Right. And so I have the experience of having made that choice. Right. But did I really make that choice? I don't know. You know, when we look in like. Uh, fMRI scans, you know, of, of people making decisions, um, you can see the decision being made neurologically before the person has the awareness mm. of having made a decision, right? And of course, choice, you know, pick the red card or pick the blue card. And they're like, blue, right? Well, you do that enough times and you can actually see that decision being made by their brain before the person has the conscious awareness of having made the decision. So that that's Free Wild. will is and choice are problematic in that way. But I think whatever the case, we are better able to kind of make a choice when we're more informed and we have more insight. And, and it's a it's a situation about which like we have a more um, refined sort of perspective, you know, like. The thing is, when somebody is struggling with a personality disorder or a mental illness, they're they're in a very reactive space a lot of the time. They're, right. they're reacting to what's happening. They're not really thinking about it. They're just reacting. So the piece of choice, right, that's being made just by some neurological, uh, you know, um, circuit is potentially a larger piece of the equation. But when a person has had the experience of sort of talking about their choices and their behavior, reflecting on them, when it's become a studied process, when they're learning more and more about the ways that they tend to react and the things they tend to react to, now like a kind of will is taking up more and more space in that equation. You know, it's less reactive and it's more responsive. Okay. Um, and so that, that's the way that I look at it and, you know, philosophers out there will will just rip that to shreds and i'm okay I'm sure. with that because i'm not that's not what i do right right but that's how i look at it you know and, and so when somebody comes to treatment a lot of times you know 90 percent of what they do is reacting 
and they're just in the habit of reacting. And those neural pathways are so reinforced by the history of reacting and reacting and reacting. Um, and then over time, as we talk about it and we reflect on it and we feel about it and they test those things out in their life, more and more of that space is taken up by responding and mm. less of it by reacting. Right. I'm always reminded of Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, mm. where he always talks about how between stimulus and response, there is a gap. And in that gap is your freedom to choose how you will respond. Yeah. And he was talking about that in regards to resentment of the Auschwitz guards, even. Mm. So he was like, you know, I got a, the freedom to choose because he said the Nazis could take away all of his freedoms, yeah. except for that, the freedom, how he would choose to respond in any kind of situation. And of yeah. course, that's the more extreme scenario, of course, but it certainly <clears throat> applies for every one of us. And I think a big part of treatment of narcissism, pathological narcissism would be just getting people to take that step back where they get a trigger, they mm -hmm. get something that would normally make them upset. And instead of just blurting out the first thing that comes to their mind, all right, pause, freeze. Yes. What's going on here? And it's hard. It's hard to do that in the moment when you get that emotional trigger. But absolutely. Yeah. That's where the growth is. Even for somebody who's not struggling with a mental illness, when you get upset enough, you get sure. stirred up enough, and it's hard to think. Sure. It's hard to make studied decisions, deliberate decisions. You're reacting. You're in a reactive frame of mind. And, and one of the things that happens for people with personality disorders is that, that they're in that reactive space, that heightened emotional space more often because they're, they're more um, susceptible, sensitive to, yeah. to things that might trigger that, right? Um, in fact, one of the main treatment approaches for personality disorders like NPD is called mentalization-based therapy. And the act of mentalizing is essentially thinking about thinking and thinking about somebody else's um, uh, motivations, right? Not, not just assuming, not just reacting, but really like, let's take a moment, let's think about what I'm feeling, about what you just did, about why you might have done what you just did, about how it probably has nothing to do with how, you know, what was going on inside of me and everything to do with what was going on inside of you. Right. And just, just really like teasing apart the motivations and the, and the separate, the separateness of our psychologies mm. in an interaction. Um, and that, that, that tends to be a good way of interrupting things like projection. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I think it's also just a way of making more space for choice, you know, for responding rather than just yeah, uh, absolutely reacting. It sounds a little bit like DBT as well. That's what that sounds like. Yeah, DBT definitely has the it, the mindfulness component, which is sort of like, you know, um, finding a space between what you feel and what you think to kind of put them together in, in, a, in what they call wise mind, which is sort of like a, a place inside of yourself where there's, again, space to think and to just be aware with non-judgmental active awareness of what, what's happening in this moment. I without gotcha. having to react to it. I see. Yeah, so I definitely want to be cognizant of your time here. But the, the last thing yeah. I wanted to mention is I think overall, and I see this a lot with people who have struggled with alcohol and drug abuse, is yeah. they have an overarching on a longer time frame unconsciousness. But once they do a drastic change, maybe put down a drink or a drug, for example, they can get to a more conscious and self-aware state where mm -hmm. before they were, they didn't have, it was just unconscious. Like they get a, a stimulus and then boom, they act out. But they can be given a gift. And I think the younger they are, when they get this, the better it is. But they can get that self-awareness where they can become conscious more. Like, okay, I'm not just going to react to the first thing I see. And I'm going to take that gap and move forward from there. Like, mm -hmm. do you see that happen? Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess, <clears throat> well, yeah, I don't, I don't work specifically with, with, you know, substance abuse issues, but um, in treatment with folks, sometimes we'll, you know, I'll just kind of take a step back uh, after we've been working together for a while and be like, you know, I, I just, I really just want to notice together, like, 
how you did that differently, you know, how, how you um, s seemed to be able to kind of really think about what was going on. And you, you recognized you needed to take a step back and feel your feelings without lashing out or without doing whatever it is, you know? Um, and, and I want to notice together, like your increased ability to tolerate ambiguity and not knowing and, you know, the feelings of threat or insult right. that, that were kind that you felt were coming at you and your ability to just kind of hold those feelings without getting rid of them, you know, by yelling or punching the wall or what, right. Just kind of like to really like notice those strengths as they develop over time. And, and celebrate them together, you know? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And the last thing here, I'm not sure if you know anything about this. This is a little bit from right field, but have you seen any narcissistic people that had success with psychedelics of some sort, like going, like doing ayahuasca? <clears throat> and I say this because I do know a lot of people I would consider narcissistic that they do gravitate to this path a little bit. Yeah. But have you seen anyone have success with that? Yeah. Yeah, actually. Um, and I don't, you know, I want to be careful because I don't want to be like, like, go, go do drugs, kids. It'll cure, you know, cure. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the thing about psychedelics is that they, in the right circumstances, the right combination of circumstance and person, right, and drug or whatever, right, in the right circumstances, uh, they can facilitate uh, self-reflection. And they can, I think there can be a way that just like, you know, uh, a radical shift in your surroundings or your circumstances can like kind of jolt you out of a, a, a well-worn pattern of thinking and behaving. I think that psychedelics can do the same thing sometimes. At least that's what I've seen. Now, I believe that. Yeah, and I want to be very clear that I'm not recommending that people go out and do illegal drugs. Talk to your doctor. Like, don't, don't do drugs are bad. Okay, no, I don't want to be like. <laughs> yeah, I get you. Yeah, yeah, because I'm not, I'm not a psychiatrist. That's outside my my scope of practice. But just to your question, um, have I seen positive results? Sometimes I have. I have to say, yeah, I have. Um, that was not under my recommendation. That was just something that the patient did. And then we talked about it uh, and we noticed the effect. Um, but I've also seen it go the other way, you know? Sure. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's not, it's not like, this is not the, the new treatment, you know, for NPD is not to go, you know, right. do a bunch of acid. Right. Um, it, it is to, I think ideally with the help of a, a licensed mental health professional, learn new ways of seeing and experiencing. Sometimes if a person happened to do drugs and it came together just right, you know, there can be a, a shift that makes a difference. Sure. But I think ideally you want that shift to occur as a result of the work you do in therapy, not because you took a substance. Right. Right. I mean, I think, a psychedelic experience, ayahuasca, mushrooms, acid, or whatever it is, you can develop some awareness in something like that. But if you don't take what you've learned into your everyday life, I think the benefits will be much less. Yeah. But like you get the awareness, but then you do something differently and you uh -huh. do something with that awareness or what, or the insights you've been given. Like Sam Harris would call it like the, the thimble full of water in the ocean of consciousness that's what he would consider the a mushroom trip. And he's like, okay. yeah, you can only bring back the thimble. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I can, I get it. Yeah. But if you do those actions in your everyday life, yeah. yeah, that could be something good. So I guess that is all I have for you today. Um, where can people find you? Yeah. So you can find me, uh, well on YouTube, my channel is heal NPD. Uh, and, uh, I'm, I, I make new videos about once a month. I'm trying to up that frequency, but it's hard because uh, mm -hmm. I got I got other stuff going on. But um, if you're curious, you can check out my book that's available on Amazon and like at Barnes and Noble and stuff like that. Um, it's called Unmasking Narcissism, A Guide to Understanding the Narcissist in Your Life. It's just a layperson's guide to the psychology of 
uh, NPD. Um, and uh, I'm also online at www.dreatonson.com. That's my website. Um, and uh, it's also the website for my um, therapy practice as well. Oh, good. And so if someone's listening to this and they have uh, narcissistic adaptations, would you recommend they try to set up a session with you? Yeah, reach out. Um, so I do currently have a wait list. I'm running a wait list for my, for my practice. Um, but I, I don't... So part of my practice is to treat narcissism. Part of my practice is to diagnose it as well. Uh, and I've got a diagnostic process that's empirically supported, and it, it's kind of a an elaborate thing. It's not just talking to the person; it's a it's actual an actual assessment, a series of assessments. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I, I reserve space in my practice for those. So if you're curious and you want to get diagnosed and you feel like that would be helpful, then I can see you sooner than if you want therapy. Uh, there is a wait list for therapy. I got you. Perhaps that would be something to talk about next time. What some of that uh, that process looks like. Of yeah. Things, like that, if you're comfortable talking about that. Yeah. But I, Mark, thank you very much for coming on the show here. I think this was very informative for a lot yeah. of people, and I think people probably learned a lot from listening to this episode. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I hope I hope it's been helpful for folks. And um, you know, thanks for doing the work you're doing, and thanks for um, for the great the great dialogue. This has been great. Thank All you. right. Thanks again, Mark. I appreciate it. You have a good one. You too. Take care. So long.